Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Well, today I'm going to step out in faith and do something here that's sometimes not always real comfortable for preachers to do, but something that I feel that God really wants me to do, and that that is I'm going to do an entire teaching today on giving. So just before we even get started, let me just say very clearly, God does not need our money. So anytime that somebody teaches you about giving, do not get the attitude, well, just another preacher trying to get your money. The point is, is even if that is their motive, even if that was their motive, if you can learn something about giving from them and you apply it to your life, God teaches us to give for us. It does so much in our lives that we cannot even begin to imagine how can God bring somebody to the point where they actually enjoy giving their money away? Boy, that was a great response. <laughs> Woo, this is going to be harder than I thought. I love giving. I mean, I love it. And I actually believe that Giving with a heart of gratitude to God and giving because you actually can now say that because of God's grace in your life, you actually really do want to help other people and you're willing to make some kind of a sacrifice to do that. To me, that is like one of the greatest miracles of the new birth that we can ever see. Because who in their right mind would want to work and work and work and then give their money away? But I love it. Amen? And this is for you. We've already received all the offerings we're receiving in this conference. You don't have to be worried. This is not about getting any more of your money. This is for you. Esther chapter 9, verses 21 and 22. Now, after God used Esther in a very special way to bring deliverance to a whole nation, to the Jewish nation, because there was a plot against them to kill them, and I won't go into that whole story, but after their breakthrough, after their victory, they were commanded by God to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day, you know, maybe that was February or March, I don't know what it was, but then it was Adar. The 14th and 15th day, every year of that month, let's go to verse 22, please. As the days on which the Jews got rest from their enemies, remember what I did for you, and as the month which was turned for them from sorrow to gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days of sending portions to one another and gifts to the poor. So the thing that I love about this is he's saying one of the ways that I want you to continue being grateful for this breakthrough that I've given you is every year on this certain day, I want you to remember what I did for you. I want you to celebrate it with a party. I don't know if you know it or not, but God really likes parties. <laughs> and I decided while I was here this weekend, and I am going to do this. I am going to have a gratitude party. I'm going to throw a party in my home and invite my family and some of my close friends, and we are going to do nothing but just sit there and just enjoy some good food and talk about the things that we're grateful for. And I, I challenge you to think about doing the same thing. We don't need to have another griping session. We need to get together and remember the great things that God has done for us. But the thing that I love about this is they were told that part of their celebration was to give. So one of the ways that we thank God for what he's done in our lives 
oh my gosh, I'm so glad that I'm not the wretched mess that I used to be. I still got a ways to go, but man, I've come a long way. I'm so glad for peace and righteousness and joy. I'm so glad that my kids are saved. I'm glad that all my grandkids are saved. And one of the ways that I can show that gratitude to God is by reaching out now with my finances and helping somebody else somewhere whose name I may never even know, helping them to find that position with God that he has so graciously given me. Amen? But I believe in going way beyond just tithing and bringing offerings to the Sunday morning service. I think that we need to live to give. All right. Philippians 1, 2 through 6. Verse 2, Paul said, Grace, favor, and blessing to you and heart peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be awesome if we still greeted each other that way? We're like, hey, ho. Oh. What's up, man? Yo. <laughs> Paul walked up to people, grace, favor, and blessing be unto you in the name of our God and Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now watch next. I, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. In every prayer of mine, I always make my entreaty and petition for you with joy and delight. I thank my God for your fellowship, your sympathetic cooperation, and your contributions and partnership. Now listen to this. In advancing the good news of the gospel from the first day you heard it until now. Now, the reason why I'm so fond of that is because I'm thinking, okay, these people got something that a lot of us must be missing. Because from the first day they heard the gospel, from the first day they received Christ as their Savior, the amazingness of what God had done for them, the joy that they felt made them immediately want to get involved in sending money to help Paul preach that to other people in other places. Maybe we're just not as excited as we should be. Maybe we've had too much Jesus in our culture, so much that we don't really appreciate what we have. But I know that's none of you. That's, I got a good group today or I wouldn't even be att attempting this. And I particularly like verse 6. I don't know what you're going to think about this, but I believe God has shown me this. And I am convinced. Now, remember, he just said, I thank God for your giving, your partnership, your contributions. And I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue right up until the day of Jesus Christ, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion. Now, what we like to do is just quote Philippians 1.6. And he that has begun a good work in you will complete it and bring it to its finish. And we're like, yeah. <laughs> but I could get up and just read the giving scripture and I wouldn't get that reaction. <laughs> and here's what I think that scripture is saying. I think he's saying that God began a good work in you the day that you were saved. Okay. You were so amazed and so grateful that you immediately wanted to help provide that for other people and you sacrificed financially to be able to do that. And I am convinced that my God, who has begun a good work in you, will bring it to its completion. Can I, let me tell you a secret. If you're just a taker and not a giver, the great work that God wants to do in you will never come to its completion you may go to heaven because your giving has nothing to do with whether you're saved or not, but as far as being happy here, being powerful here, let me tell you something. Givers are powerful people. I mean, they are powerful. The devil doesn't want to mess with them. There's something about them that you may not know and understand, 
But giving is for us. It's not God trying to take our money away from us. It's for us. It's something that he does for us. How is it possible? I mean, how is it really possible to be an unhappy Christian? Because we think more about what we don't have instead of the amazing thing that Christ has done in us and that it won't be long. Even if I live to be 100, that's nothing compared to eternity. And he's going to come back for me and the trumpet's going to blow and the sky's going to split and I'm going to go to live in his presence forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And back when I wasn't a giver and I didn't care about anybody else, I was religious, I was actually saved and I believe I would have gone to heaven, but I can tell you that I would not have taken anybody else with me. There would have been nobody else there because of me. I could have even kept a few people out the way I acted. <laughs> but I am happy to stand here now and say that I believe that millions of souls will be there because God let me preach the gospel to them. Now, there's way too many unhappy people in church. Well, you say, Joyce, I got problems. You know what? I understand that. And I'm trying to help you. If you need a breakthrough, one of the things you can do is get more generous. <laughs> well, oh, I'm going I'm to show you a scripture where literally... You, you can sow special offerings when you have special needs. And I mean, this is beyond your regular giving. And when you pray and you mix it with giving, whoa, buddy. It's the same type of thing as prayer and fasting. It's like you need a breakthrough. You need to push through some opposition. And so one of the ways you can do that is by saying the devil's coming after me. I am going to be good to somebody. I am going to bless somebody. I'm going to give to the building program. I'm going to give more to help the poor. Instead of just withdrawing and like... Don't eat your tithe in your time of mourning, the Bible says. That means when you're having problems, you don't stop giving. <laughs> okay, so I believe, and this is my meeting, so I can tell you what I believe. <laughs> I believe that a lot of the reason why people are unhappy if they are unhappy it's really not their problems, although I know our problems can really, you know, get after us. But I think it's more because they, they get entrenched in their problems and they stop, they, they spend their time trying to do something about something they can't do anything about instead of continuing to do what they can do. It amazes me that when I have a problem, God will not let me help myself. No way, no how can I help myself. But while I cannot help myself with my problem, he will anoint me to help somebody else with their problem. It's like, what's with that? If I can help you, why can't I help me? You know why? Because God doesn't want us reaching in. He wants us reaching out. And so here's the secret. I have a problem. I can't help me. I pray. I help you, then God moves on the seed that I've sown, and through you, he brings a harvest back into my life to solve my problem. Do I need to say it again? Did you get it? You cannot help yourself, so quit sitting around thinking up all these nifty little ways that you can do this, that, or something else to get your breakthrough, and just say, God, I am not smart enough to solve my problems, but I can find somebody that's hurting, and I can help them. Takers are miserable people. And I made a decision for my life about 10 years ago that I am finished with one-sided relationships. I don't want to be in personal relationship with people who are always, Joyce, can you do this for me? Joyce, can you do that for me? Joyce, can you do this for me? But they never do anything for me. 
That's not God's way. That's not partnership. Partnership is I do for you what I can do and you do for me what you can do. Let's take an example of breathing. We breathe in and we breathe out. Goes on all day long. Okay, I want you to try for just a minute. Let's just breathe in and see what happens. Let's just, let's just, just take a breath and hold it. Take another breath and hold it. Now take another breath and hold it. <laughs> take one more breath. That's <sighs> not going to be long and I'm going to pass out. I think we've got a lot of fainting saints in church pews. <laughs> Don't just come to church to get your blessing. I'm going to go get my blessing. Yes, we want to bless you. But I would rather that you spend a few minutes praying before you come in the building. God, show me somebody I can help when I get inside. And then when it's offering time, you should be the loudest, happiest clapper in the place. Do you know how terrible it is for a preacher when they say they're going to receive an offering and you get dead quiet in the room? You think this is easy? I would be happy if I never had to ask people for a penny. But it's not going to be that way because God wants all of us involved. Yeah. Now, <laughs> let's think about Elijah. There's a great story about Elijah that I want us to look at. And it is in 1 Kings 19. So there was a famine in the land, and God fed Elisha, Elijah by a brook supernaturally. Ravens came morning and evening and brought him bread and flesh. But after a while, the Bible says the brook dried up. Well, let me just say to you, if your brook has dried up, don't get nervous. Because if God provided that brook and it dried up, he's surely going to provide one that's going to even be better. Amen? And the word of the Lord came to him saying, Now I want you to get up and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. And behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks and he called to her, bring me a little water in a vessel that I might drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, bring me a little morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, now I don't want you to miss this. As the Lord your God lives, I have not a loaf baked, but only a handful of meal in a jar and a little bit of oil in a bottle. And you see, I'm going to gather two sticks that I might go in and make it for me and my son that we might eat it and die. Well, thank you, God. <laughs> the brook was more exciting. I thought maybe I was getting a rich widow, but no. I have a poverty-stricken, depressed, suicidal woman It's true. And so she did as he said. He said, fear not. Do as you have said. Make yourself a little cake. Make me a little cake of it first. No, you didn't hear me. I've only got enough for me and my son. Well, you give me some first. Now, do you know how this would come down in the media today? Joyce Meyer, televangelist, <laughs> prosperity preacher, Rob's poor widow, <laughs> demanding her last morsel. <laughs> I 
I have no idea what kind of hits I'm gonna get from this sermon, but. <laughs> Long story short, she did what he said. Her and her son ate everything they wanted all through the, the whole famine. And so what I wanna say to you is Elijah did not need that widow. God doesn't need your money. I'm not asking you to give or teaching you on giving today because I want to get more money. We've already done all the offerings. And I'll just even be bold enough to say, if you're willing to give, but you'd rather not give it to me, well and good. Don't give it to me. Give it to somebody else. Because I know that God will take care of me. So I'm not, I am not trying to get your money. I am trying to teach you the miracle of giving. Amen? And I am expecting our finances to increase because God will honor obedience and I'm doing the part that he is asking me to do. Elijah did not need that widow. Now listen to me. The widow needed a miracle. So God sent her an anointed man of God and said, now you feed him. You give him some first and I'll make sure that you never run out. I mean, if you're going to give somewhere, you should give in to some anointed ground. Not some dead place that you can't wait to get out of. You find something where things are happening. Let me say it again. Elijah did not need the poor, broke, depressed, downtrodden widow who said, I'm, we're going to eat our last meal and die. She had a plan. <laughs> and it wasn't a good one. She needed Elijah. She needed to give into the anointing of God that was on his life. And the thing that is so amazing, I love this, is if she wouldn't have done that, she would have ended up with a dead son. Because as it so happens, Elijah stayed in her house. Her son, long time after that, ended up dying. And because Elijah was there, he was able to bring him back to life. So I wonder, now listen, I wonder how many miracles we miss in our life because God speaks to us to do some little thing over here or maybe even some big thing, and we don't know it, but it's connected to our destiny way down here somewhere. Amen. Well, I started today's teaching by saying that I love giving. And I encourage you to get excited about living to give because it not only honors God, but it's good for us. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you again.